Hi everyone, I'm Katrina Marks. Um, I am currently a freshman at Purdue, um, which is home to two of our own very, uh, very own World Food Prize laureates, one of whom is actually sitting here. So I am very excited to be presenting today. I lived in Changsha, China over the summer, doing hybrid rice research at China National Hybrid Rice Research and Development Center. And yes, there is an acronym for that, but it's way too long. <laughs> All right. So over the summer, I was locating a gene in rice that turned the rice seed or grain red. We call this the red seed hole gene because it visibly, when you look at the plant, turned the seed hole red. But if you took the hole off, it actually made the rice grain itself red. Quick overview of hybrid rice. Yuan Longping, himself a World Food Prize laureate, literally had a dream about hybrid rice. There's kind of a Chinese proverb that if you dream of something like that, then you should, you should pursue it because maybe it actually exists. So um, after years and years of searching through fields, Yuan Longping did indeed find the kind of rice that you need to make hybrids, which is a male sterile rice. In 1970, he found this and soon intensive research began happening around this and we started to see heterosis in rice. And heterosis is when you make a hybrid of two uh, related species and their daughter plant um, has better yield or um, better resistance to drought or just in general is better than either parent was. The three-line method of hybrid rice was the first to be created, which takes more time, shows good heterosis, generally stable, takes a very long time. The two-line method is much quicker. It only requires uh, like two generations of hybridization. Um, and it generally shows better heterosis, but there may be more variation plant to plant. Um, so generally, the three-line method is still used because of the uniformity it can achieve. After many stages of development, um, we are currently reaching yields of 15 tons per hectare or more um, in the lab and in the test fields. Um, this is an increase from around 3 to 4 tons per hectare that was commonly seen in China, or as some of my friends from Africa have told me, they see around 1 to 2 tons per hectare. So this is an incredible increase. Um, Yuan Ping has the goal of eventually reaching about 18 tons per hectare. And this is me and my fellow intern um, standing right, standing next to the current highest yielding rice in the world. Um, that was extremely exciting. The importance of improving rice yield can't be understated. Rice is an incredibly crucial crop to over 60% of the world's population. And as the population continues to increase, the amount of rice has to increase to keep up with that population growth. Um, Yuan Longping said that every hectare of land currently feeds 17 people. Uh, every hectare of land producing rice currently feeds 27 people, I'm sorry. But by 2050, we'll need to feed 43 people. And we will have to, um, as scientists, learn to catch up with this um, necessary yield increase. Um, however, hybrid rice has already fed millions more than we thought possible. And we hope that this trend will continue and um, hopefully feed millions of people across the world. So, how did I go about locating the gene? First, we hybridized the red seed hole gene using the hybridizing the red hole, which throw back to freshman genetics, freshman biology. Red seed hole, let's assign that as like homozygous recessive, and then we have the Nippon Bell, which was the white type. Um, the rice was actually white, and we'll say that that's homozygous dominant. And then um, all of their children are going to create heterozygous children that all are, that have white rice. And then finally, their grandchildren, we will begin to see that red rice again, and some of those will have the um, homozygous recessive genes. So that F2 generation with the homozygous recessive genes is really what I was interested in. How do we study a new gene in rice? Um, how do you actually go about locating where this gene is? So this is the hybridization again. This is just showing that the F1 plants are self-crossing, pollinating each other uh, in order to create those F2 plants. What are we going to do first? Well, first we're going to try to map the genome. Then we're going to locate the like specific parts of the genes um, that we think contribute to this red seed hole. 
Um, then we're going to clone them and essentially put them back into the red seed hole. And if we can turn that red plant white using tissue culture, then we'll know we found it. And then we'll look at the function of these genes. So this is a page gel, and this is how we look at polymorphism. You'll see that these are kind of grouped in groups of two. And the odd number is the homozygous recessive mutants, or RH4, also known as the red seed hole. And the even numbers are the dominant nip and bell variety. So when there is a difference in a set of these two, we know there is a difference in the genome. <coughs> so for instance, number one and two, you can see up there, are the same, so that's not really a spot that we would look for this difference. However, three and four do show a difference, so we might want to use more primers and kind of investigate more into that difference. Here we have a bulk segregation analysis where we will look at the RH4 plant, the Nippon Bell, and then the F2 mutant and F2 wild type. So this is more precise mapping and this will help us see even more closely where the gene itself may be. This is linkage, again using page gel. The plus is the recessive mutants, the minus is the dominant nip and bell. The rest essentially are F2 mutants. So what we want to see is do these lines line up with the dominant with the recessive or both. Typically, you would see that one to two to one ratio of uh, homozygous dominant to heterozygous to homozygous recessive. But here we saw 23 to zero to 25. So that's absolutely not what you would expect to see. And so we can call that linkage and say that that might be where, we, where we're looking and continue to narrow down even further. So this is another page show and this one actually shows that the ratio of recessive plants to dominant plants to heterozygotes is 31 to 0 to 0 so that is a pretty close linkage with the gene after this we kind of narrowed it down and we actually sent this to a company to sequence the genome and then we can look at these websites that'll kind of help us find similar genes that have already been discovered in other plants now we're going to clone the gene that we found it so we um, design the candidate gene primer, which you can like use some websites and type in the base pair sequence that you want, and they'll ship you a nice little test tube looking thing with some DNA in it, and you're like, awesome, now I can clone some genes. And um, <laughs> we PCR'd um, the, these target fragments, put them in E. coli, which we use as a vector or basically as like a car to take the, uh, the gene that we want to be in the rice to the mutant. Essentially we're trying to turn the red rice white again. And then we, you know, grew some E. coli which was pretty cool and I, you know, I felt kind of awesome growing E. coli in a lab. <laughs> All right, so this is how we verify the candidate gene. This is the whole tissue culture process. And this is, this is really complicated, but again, we're just transferring the white gene that we have located back to the red mutant. And if that red mutant will turn white, we know we found it. These are some pictures of me in the lab working on the tissue culture. I got to make really good friends with a lot of the lab people. I spent a lot of time in the lab, and that's actually why I'm focusing more on the lab work than some of the cultural experience because I think the lab work was um, some of what really stood out to me. This tissue culture starts with just rice seedlings. They're all grown on a culture medium. And then they grow calluses, which we choose the best calluses in a sense, the um, ones with the most white, the most live, to uh, go on and grow into actual rice plants. Um, with different culture media and using the E. coli growing with them, they will take that DNA from the E. coli into themselves and produce that phenotype. And obviously rice plants are amazing and adorable, so I was holding one there with one of my friends taking a picture. Okay, so after we find this gene, we got to analyze its function. So it has kind of different aspects of the function. Um, the physiology, so like contents of uh, nutrients, uh, chlorophyll, things that make you know plants do plant things. And then also you have the molecular biology, like how does it interact between proteins and science and all that stuff. Cytology, we didn't really do much of that. Um, I only had two months and we didn't have enough time. And also the bioinformatics, which is 
um, more of like a structural analysis. You can make like a tree that shows how this gene is related to other genes in rice and then also how it might be related to other mutations found in other plants. Um, so it can contribute to other people's research as well. So what we did with the RNA that we found from this, we we're kind of starting to look at the proteins now because RNA is what transcribes the proteins. So we extract RNA, we transcript it to cDNA, run a qPCR, look at the different levels of it and just try to make sure, right here we're just essentially making sure that we extracted our RNA well and the transcription to cDNA went well and our concentrations are high. So now we can extract the proteins from the rice and test their concentrations, run a page gel, again just trying to make sure that we did all of that correctly. And then we can transfer to a membrane and combine with antibodies which will assist with that uh, moving the white gene back into the red mutant. This is one of those really cool tree things. This shows the program that we use too, where you can put in your base pair sequence and it will tell you like how closely associated with other genes this is. Um, so that can be really helpful in um, like choosing what to hybridize with um, for future crosses. And then these are some pictures of me working in the lab. I extracted DNA and I used chloroform and I felt dangerous. I made lots of PCR reaction systems, ran them a lot. I made a lot of friends in the lab too. One of the interesting things about the lab is that a lot of people spent a lot of time there um, because it was a really good place to um, use the internet. Um, they had really good Wi-Fi. And <laughs> Wi-Fi isn't really as common in China as it is here. So people would just hang out in the lab on weekends and watch Netflix or, well, Chinese Netflix or, I don't know, there's a guy that always sat next to me that would watch South Park and, I don't know, Game of Thrones was big too. They would like find it on the internet somehow. Um, also, I gave English names to some of these people because I couldn't, I, like, I just could not pronounce their Chinese names. So the guy that's sitting next to me on the computer down there, his name is Jeremy, and his wife's name is Candace. And for any of you that know Phineas and Ferb, I thought they were just like Jeremy and Candace. <laughs> <laughs> so I also got to practice in the field of like planting actual rice. This was one of my favorite parts because you just got to get all muddy and it was completely acceptable. Here, you see the uh, smaller squares? <laughs> That's like very small um, initial hybrid process where they kind of just like test, hey, is this even something that we should pursue in a larger quantity, see if we even want to try to hybridize this. And then I got to plant some rice out there. One of the cool things about rice is that you kind of throw seeds in the mud, essentially, and they grow up to be little seedlings. And then when they're little seedlings, you take them out and you like, kind of like dab the water off of them and then you walk over to another field and you plant them in like in like rows and everything and that's how they look organized um, and then they they grow to maturity there so I got to do some of the transplanting even though um, we weren't really there for the time for a, like a whole rice harvest our mentors made sure that we got to practice every part of the um, rice cultivation process and one of the interesting things is that we actually saw people at the research center, in the research center test plots, plowing by ox, which I thought was interesting and I didn't expect to see. However, there were tractors, and um, I, I think the tractors were kind of funny because they were like spurting mud everywhere with their tillers. It's kind of, kind of weird. I understand why they use the oxes. They're much cuter. I also had the opportunity to attend some lectures, um, one by Yuan Longping himself, and um, several by um, other other professors. It was just an incredible academic atmosphere there. And I also got to travel to Gansu. Um, uh, one of my mentor's parents lived there um, and we were able to see like an entirely different world in Northwest China. And last but not least, Zhang Jiajie is the set of Avatar actually um, and was an incredible uh, weekend trip that I got to take with Jessica. Um, out to Zhang Jiajie to see all the mountains and some of the natural, national parks that China has. So I thought that was really awesome. Thank you, that's it.